Welcome to Faces of Fleet, an interview series from WorkTrek, where we take a more personal look at the many interesting people in Fleet and some of the experiences that helped shape them into who they are today. Before we get started, be sure to hit that like button and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss an episode. I'm Lauren Fletcher, Executive Editor of WorkTrek, and today I'm chatting with Rob Mitten, Head of Connected Car Business Development at Geotab. Rob is no stranger to Fleet. Since 2000, he's been involved in the automotive industry in some fashion. Starting out at General Motors and Communications, he moved into GM Fleet and Commercial Sales in 2008, where I know I had the chance to work with him quite a bit. After a few more years with GM Fleet, Rob moved over to Director of National Fleet Sales at VNG before transitioning to Geotab and the connected vehicle side of the fleet industry. Today, I'm especially excited to share a little bit of Rob's story with all of you. Welcome, Rob. Thank you so much, Lauren. Great to be here. Great to have you. So let's start with some background. I shared a little bit already, but how did you end up involved in fleet in the first place? Well, kind of an interesting story. So uh, as you mentioned, um, I was in, uh, you know, the first two decades of my career was spent in uh, communications and marketing. And I was actually uh, the head of communications for GM's fleet and commercial division. And the, uh, the vice president that was running the division at the time said, you know, called me into his office one day and said, Rob, I think you're wasting your time in PR. You're a born salesperson. I want you to move into the sales organization. Well, I had never in my wildest dreams even considered, you know, a, a career in sales. Um, but I thought about it. And, uh, you know, I thought about the fact that, you know what? Being on the revenue generating side of the ledger as opposed to the expense side of the ledger may not be a bad thing necessarily. So um, I, I made the decision. And when I got over there, you know, I found that there were quite a few similarities between, you know, communications and, and sales and that, you know, at the end of the day, you really need to be a good communicator. You need to be able to, you know, deliver a, a message. You need to put yourself kind of in the in the shoes of you know, the person that you're talking to and, you know, understand kind of their, their point of view. And really, whether you're, you're talking about public relations or sales, it's all about the art of persuasion. And since you started, you've moved from the OEM to the technical side of the fleet industry. How has that move benefited your in, uh, understanding of fleet challenges now? Well, you know, having that uh, OEM experience kind of gives me a, a good perspective uh, in the current uh, role that I have with with Geotab. Um, you know, we work with a lot of uh, OEMs and especially, you know, mo most recently, a lot of the EV startups. And, you know, it's it's so hard to bring a new vehicle to market. There are so many challenges. Um, you know, you've got uh, engineering constraints, financial constraints, and you know, just being able to have a conversation with these uh, uh, these companies and kind of walk them through, you know, the, the whole idea of do you want to build something or does it make more sense to to buy it? And you know, it, interestingly enough, when you, when we start out, almost almost everybody wants to kind of build their own um, you know solution, uh, wh whether it's a fleet management platform or anything else, but as they start to learn about what gets involved in that and all the, all the resource constraints that they have, it, it starts to realize on them, you know what, maybe it makes sense to partner you know, with a company that already has basically a turnkey solution so that we can focus on the things that are really gonna differentiate our product from the rest of the market. And touching on a more personal topic, you recently struggled with and survived cancer. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience? Um, yes, thank you. So in uh, 2013, I was diagnosed with a very rare lymphoma. In fact, it was so rare that few doctors had ever even heard of it, let alone treated a patient that had it. Um, and, you know, my wife was doing a lot of internet searching of my symptoms, and she kept coming back with the same answer, a disease called cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. And, you know, Lauren, I, I credit the fact that I'm alive today to uh, my wife Sharon's determination to not accept what the doctors were telling us and to make them test for this very rare cancer. So, you know, after 18 months of a lot of suffering, suffering and deteriorate, deteriorating health, 
um, you know, we got a confirmed diagnosis. That was the same diagnosis that Sharon had kind of been telling the doctors all along. And, you know, I'll never forget that day. Um, you know, the doctor called and, you know, gave us the, gave us the news and, you know, I heard the words that you never want to hear from your doctor. He said, I suggest you get your financial affairs in order. Um, so, you know, that was, uh, yeah, that was not something easy to take, but, uh, you know, we both decided that we weren't just going to give in, we were going to fight. So we tried a number of treatments, none of them worked. We finally decided that my best chance for survival was to undergo a stem cell transplant, which, um, you know, it's a very risky procedure, but we really had nothing to lose. So in 2014, I underwent a transplant and essentially, you know, what happens is they kill off your immune system and then they bring you back to life with a new immune system. I, I tell people it's kind of like, you know, that story of Lazarus in the, in the Bible. Um, so in order to have a stem cell transplant, you need to find a donor that has uh, matching DNA to yours. And uh, I was fortunate to find an unrelated donor through a, uh, the International Bone Marrow Donor Registry that's run by the Be The Match organization. Um, but you know the whole ordeal required three weeks in the hospital and then another three months in isolation uh, in an apartment that was across the street from the hospital because you know this you know the the hospital was two and a half hours away from Orlando where where we live and so um, you know you had to be very close to the hospital in case you know something bad happened where you could get back there very soon but anyway I was fortunate I had a successful transplant um, but you know, not everyone is as fortunate. And, you know, I think about that every single day. Well, I, for one, am grateful that you are still around. And I know a lot of our viewers out there are as well. Um, what are some of the lessons you've taken from your cancer survival that apply to how you work day to day now? Well, you know, when a doctor tells you that you're most likely going to die within two years, um, it gives you a new perspective on things, right? Um, things that would bother me before um, seem pretty insignificant now. And, you know, I, I believe that you need to do hard things in life, things that you've never done that kind of push you beyond your comfort zone um, so that you feel that you've accomplished something. You know, you've tried your best, you put in the effort needed, and it helps you build that self-confidence in knowing that you can really do things that maybe you thought um, you couldn't handle. And so, you know, that applies to work as, as well as to one's personal life. And, you know, I, I really live by the mantra that you never know how strong you are until being strong is the only choice you have. That's a great one. Um, you briefly mentioned uh, Be A Match earlier. I understand you're a volunteer for the group. Can you tell us a little bit about that group and your efforts with them? Uh, yes. So Be The Match manages the National Marrow Donor Program, which is the most diverse uh, bone marrow donor registry in the world. And, you know, for a lot of people like me who are diagnosed with leukemia or lymphoma, a bone marrow transplant is really their only hope for a cure. But also like me, about 70 percent of people don't have a match within their family. So they have to go to this registry and be the match assist. They, they search through tens of thousands of people who have volunteered to be a donor uh, for someone who, uh, who needs a, a match for a transplant. I'm alive today because a young man that I didn't know, he didn't know me, he decided to join that registry. So yeah, I, I, I volunteer for Be The Match. I speak at uh, events and donor drives to get more people to join. I mean, it's a, it's a simple numbers game. The more people that are on the registry, the better the odds of finding a match. And I tell people, you know what? It's probably the easiest thing you'll ever do that could save someone's life. And if someone's interested in knowing more about that, I really would encourage them to go to bethematch.org you can find out more. You can find out how you yourself could join that donor registry. And we'll make sure we drop the link to that in the description of this video below. So anybody who is interested in, in volunteering or checking that out, uh, make sure you check out the description of this video. 
Um, on to a little bit of a more fun thing. Um, what are some of your favorite hobbies or passions outside of work right now that we might not know about? Well, I really enjoy cooking uh, for family and friends uh, and, you know, trying out new recipes, things that I've never, uh, you know, done before. Um, I'm also an avid pickleball player and uh, I love to fish. And of course, uh, that's a great passion to have for someone who lives in Florida. Yes, I am definitely looking forward to getting some fishing in. We're in central Oregon with a lot of lakes and, and it's uh, about time to warm up and get ready to go out there. So bringing it back to fleet, what has been your favorite part about being involved in this incredible industry? You know, I, I have learned so much just about business and, and different businesses by working in fleet. Every customer is different and it's fascinating to learn about you know their own unique business and so you know you've got companies you know over the years that i've worked with like you know at&t and mary Kay, you know two very different businesses right but very interesting in their own right and just you know to to be able to really understand um you know how, how that works how they operate is one is one of the great things about you know being in the fleet business the other thing and it's you know been said many times before right is you know it's an industry really built on relationships and you know i i can say every job i've gotten has been you know based on the fact of a relationship that uh, you know i've uh, i've created or, or someone has created with me and and definitely i've got more friends in the fleet industry than, than i can count um the other thing is that, you know, I really try to be a mentor to folks, both formally and informally. Um, you know, building relationships is about giving uh, as much or more than you get. And that's really something that I try to embody. Well, Rob, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me and share a little bit about your passion and your personal story. I really appreciate it. Lauren, it was a pleasure and a lot of fun. For anyone else interested in learning more about Geotab, Be A Match, or for more episodes of Faces of Fleet or Truck Chat, check out the links below. And as always, thanks for tuning in. Hit that like button and comment below to let me know who I should be chatting with next. And be on the lookout for more episodes of Truck Chat coming soon, where I'll continue to focus on the people and the issues that matter most to work truck fleets.